All right, moving right along then in Spengler, we're in the decline of the West here. The third chapter, the problem of world history. Uh, physiognomic and systematic is the subsection's title. Uh, and now we're up to subsection three here. So we're going to follow the transformations of this distinction between physiognomic uh, and systematic. Physiognomy, by the way, is uh, the name for this outdated science that used to proceed by uh, uh, that used to proceed by tactility and seeing things like, for example, the old idea that if a guy was a criminal, he's going to look like a criminal. Physically, he'll look like a criminal. Um, it kind of follows that line of thinking. Um, so it's outdated, but he means physiognomy in a different sense here. He means uh, physiognomic tact, using your intuition uh, to feel your way through culture forms the way Goethe did, not the hardcore intellect that wants to resolve everything into a series of laws. So that's what he means by physiognomy here. And of course these parallel physiognomy then uh, parallels world as history and the systematic mentality of, let's say, a Kant or a Hegel. Uh, follows the parallel of the world as nature, the realm of laws. So he says in subsection 3, there emerge then, as the two basic elements of all world picturing, the principle of form, gestalt, and the principle of law, gazettes. So gestalt versus gazettes. The more decidedly a particular world picture shows the traits of nature, the more unconditionally law and number prevail in it, and the more purely intuitive the picture of the world as eternally becoming, the more alien to numbers its manifold and intangible elements. Goethe hated mathematics. Uh, I don't gather that Heidegger liked it very much either. Neither do I. Neither did Nietzsche. <laughs> it's just a certain temperament that, um, that understands the world in terms of, of becoming. Um, form is something mobile, something becoming, something passing. The doctrine of formation is the doctrine of transformation. Uh, metamorphosis is the key to the whole alphabet of nature, so runs a note of Goethe's, marking already the methodic difference between his famous exact percipient fancy, which quietly lets itself be worked upon by the living, and the exact killing procedure of modern physics. But whatever the process, a remainder consisting of so much of the alien element as is present is always found. In strict natural sciences, this remainder takes the form of the, inev of the inevitable theories and hypotheses which are imposed on and leaven the stiff mass of number and formula. In historical research, it appears as chronology, the number structure of dates and statistics, which, alien though number is to the essence of becoming, is so thoroughly woven around and into the world of historical forms that it is never felt to be intrusive, for it is devoid of mathematical import. Chronological number distinguishes uniquely occurring actualities. Mathematical number, constant possibilities. Two different things. The one sharpens the images and works up the outlines of epoch and fact for the understanding I, but the other is itself the law, which it seeks to establish, the end and aim of research. Chronological number is a scientific means of pioneering borrowed from the science of sciences, mathematics, and used as such without regard to its specific properties. Compare, for instance, the meaning of the two symbols, 12 times 8 equals 96, and 18 October 1823. It is the same difference in the use of figures that prose and poetry present in the use of words. One other point remains to be noted. As the becoming always lies at the base of the become, and as the world picture representative of becoming is that which history gives us, Therefore, history is the original world form, and nature, the fully elaborated world mechanism, is the late world form that only the men of a mature culture can completely actualize. So in that springtime phase that we were talking about on his timelines, that's the realm of the world as history, becoming. Uh, it takes a while for the intellect to slowly gain the stage enough to where only in the late culture period can a mathematical mentality like Newton's or Galileo's finally capture the world and freeze it into a static mode of arrested laws and functions uh, that takes a while for the culture to develop up to that point where it can produce that kind of uh, world picture. Um, in fact, uh, the darkness encompassing the simple soul of primitive mankind, which we can realize even today from their religious customs and myths, that entirely organic world of pure willfulness of hostile demons, and kindly powers, 
What's well, through and through a living and swaying whole, understandable, indefinable, incalculable? We may call this nature if we like, but it is not what we mean by nature, i.e., the strict image projected by a knowing intellect. Only the souls of children and of great artists can now hear the echoes of this long-forgotten world of nascent humanity, but it echoes still, and not rarely, even in the inelastic nature medium that the city spirit of the mature culture is remorselessly building up around the individual, hence that acute antagonism between the scientific, modern, and the artistic, unpractical world idea, which every late period knows, the man of fact and the poet do not and cannot understand one another. Hence comes, too, that tendency of historical study, which must inevitably contain an element of the childish, the dreamy, the Gertaean, to dress up as a science, to be, using its own naive word, materialistic, at the imminent risk of becoming a mere physics of public life. Nature, in the exact sense, is a way of possessing actuality which is special to the few, restricted to the megalopolitans of the late periods of great cultures, masculine, perhaps even senatorial, while history is the naive, youthful, more or less instinctive way that is proper to all men alike, and since he's characterized nature as masculine, I presume that we characterize uh, the world of forms as feminine. That's the world of Bakufin's mother right and Goethe's uh, realm of the mothers. Uh, think of, for, for instance, the three uh, women at the beginning of Wagner's opera, Das Rheingold, who are a transformation of the three fates, Atropos, Clotho, and Lachesis, and there they are transformed into the Norns, who weave man's fates. They represent past, present, future. They are a symbol of temporal becoming, actually. The Norns are. Uh, at least that is the position of the number-based, unmystical, dissectable, and dissected nature of Aristotle and Kant, the Sophists and the Darwinians, modern physics and chemistry, uh, vis-a-vis the lived, felt, and unconfined nature of Homer and the Eddas of Doric and Gothic man. To overlook this is to miss the whole essence of historical treatment. It is history that is the truly natural and the exact mechanically correct nature of the scientist that is the artificial conception of world by soul. Hence the paradox that modern man finds nature study easy and historical study hard. It's interesting that um, Spangler was a man who could do mathematics. Um, unlike all these other guys, myself, Nietzsche, um, Goethe, he could do the math. Um, the whole chapter that he wrote on the meaning of numbers is testament to that. Um, so he is able to hold both form worlds in his imagination at the same time. The world as a becoming thing governed by destiny and the world uh, as a, a realm of laws governed by the causality principle he can access either one of these form worlds, but it's very clear from his tone and the way he puts things that he definitely sides with the world as becoming, with the Gretaean world, uh, not the Newtonian world, even though he can do the Newtonian world if he wants to. Tendencies towards a mechanistic idea of the world proceeding wholly from mathematical delimitation and logical differentiation from law and causality appear quite early. They are found in the first centuries of all cultures, still weak, scattered and lost in the full tide of the religious world conception. The name to be recalled here is that of Roger Bacon. Uh, he's one of these Gothic monks from around 1200, uh, who are one of the first guys to begin thinking about the world, uh, uh, world as a nature picture. As they become interested in science and optics, uh, they create the first clocks, some of the first machines and mechanisms. They're interested in the properties of magnetism. All these guys. But soon these tendencies acquire a sterner character, like everything that is wrung out of the soul and has to defend itself against human nature. They are not wanting in arrogance and exclusiveness. Quietly, the spatial and comprehensible comprehension is, in its essence, number, and its structure quantitative, uh, becomes prepotent throughout the outer world of the individual and, aiding and aided by the simple impressions of sensuous life, affects a mechanical synthesis of the causal and legal sort so that at long last, the sharp consciousness of the megalopolitan, be he of Thebes, Babylon, Benares, Alexandria, or a West European cosmopolis, is subjected to so consistent a pressure of natural law notions that when scientific and philosophical prejudice, it is no more than that, dictates the proposition that this condition of the soul is the soul, and the mechanical world picture is the world, the assertion is scarcely challenged. It has been made predominant by logicians like Aristotle and Kant, but Plato and Goethe have rejected it 
and refuted it. Those two groups constitute an opposition. Aristotle for the world as nature, Plato for the world as becoming, uh, Kant for the world as nature, Goethe for the world as becoming, and they both represent the final uh, peak of great philosophical metaphysical outlook uh, that comes in at the uh, tail end of the culture period. So now we have a uh, subsection four, the task of world knowing for the man of the higher cultures a need seen as a duty of expressing his own essence it is certainly in every case the same though its process may be called science or philosophy and though its affinity to artistic creation and to faith intuition may for one be something felt and for another something questionable. It is to present without accretions that form of the world picture which to the individual in each case is proper and significant and for him so long as he does not compare is in fact the world. The task is necessarily a double one in view of the distinction between nature and history. Each speaks its own form language which differs utterly from that of the other and however the two may overlap and confuse one another in an unsifted and ambiguous world picture such as that of everyday life, they are incapable of any inner unity. Direction and extension are the outstanding characters which differentiate the historical and the scientific kind of imp impressibility, and it is totally impossible for a man to have both working creatively within him at the same time. <laughs> the double meaning of the German word uh, ferna, distance and farness, uh, is illuminating. Uh, in the one order of ideas it implies futurity, in the other a spatial interval of standing apart, and the reader will not fail to remark that the historical materialist almost necessarily conceives time as a mathematical dimension, while for the born artist, on the contrary, as the lyrics of every land show us, the distance impressions made by deep landscapes, clouds, horizon, and setting sun attach themselves without an effort to the sense of a future. The Greek poet denies the future, and consequently he neither sees nor sings of the things of the future. He cleaves to the near, as he belongs to the present entirely. The natural science investigator, the productive reasoner in the full sense of the word, whether he be an experimenter like Faraday, a theorist like Galileo, a calculator like Newton, finds in his world only directionless quantities, which he measures, tests, and arranges. It is only the quantitative that is capable of being grasped through figures, of being causally defined, of being captured in a law or formula, and when it has achieved this, pure nature knowledge has shot its bolt. All its laws are quantitative connections, or as the physicist puts it, all physical processes run a course in space, an expression which a Greek physicist would have corrected without altering the fact into all physical processes occur between bodies, conformably to the space-denying feeling of the classical soul. So the classical soul is both space-denying on the one hand and historically denying on the other. The historical kind of impression process is alien to everything quantitative and affects a different organ. To world as nature, certain modes of apprehension. As to world as history, certain other modes are proper. We know them and use them every day, without as yet having become aware of their opposition. There is nature knowledge and there is man knowledge. There is scientific experience and there is vital experience. Let the reader track down this contrast into his own inmost being and he will understand what I mean. All modes of comprehending the world may, in the last analysis, be described as morphology. The morphology of the mechanical and the extended, a science which discovers and orders nature laws and causal relations, is called systematic. The morphology of the organic, of history and life and all that bears the sign of direction and destiny, is called physiognomic. So now he names them, uh, systematic and physiognomic. Let's see, where are we at here? I think we have time for another subsection. Okay, subsection 5 then. In the West, the systematic mode of treating the world reached and passed its culminating point during the last century, while the great days of physiognomic have still to come. In a hundred years, all sciences that are still possible on this soil will be parts of a single, vast physiognomic of all things human. This is what the morphology of world history means. In every science, and in the aim no less than in the content of it, Man tells the story of himself. Scientific experience is spiritual self-knowledge. It is from this standpoint, as a chapter of physiognomic, that we have just treated of mathematics. 
We were not concerned with what this or that mathematician intended, nor with the savant as such or his results as a contribution to an aggregate of knowledge, but with the mathematician as a human being, with his work as a part of the phenomenon of himself, with his knowledge and purposes as a part of his express expression. Uh, this alone is of importance to us here. He is the mouthpiece of the culture which tells us about itself through him, and he belongs as personality, as soul, as discoverer, thinker, and creator to the physiognomy of that culture. Every mathematic, in that it brings out and makes visible to all the idea of number that is proper to itself and inborn in its conscious being, is, whether the expression form be a scientific system or, as in the case of Egypt, an architecture, the confession of a soul. If it is true that the intentional accomplishments of a mathematic belong only to the surface of history, it is equally true that its unconscious element, its number as such, and the style in which it builds up its self-contained cosmos of forms are an expression of its existence, its blood. Its life history of ripening and withering, its deep relation to the creative acts, the myths, and the cults of the same culture, such things are the subject matter of a second or historical morphology, though the possibility of such a morphology is hardly yet admitted. The visible foregrounds of history, therefore, have the same significance as the outward phenomena of the individual man, his statue, his bearing, his air, his stride, his way of speaking and writing, as distinct from what he says or writes. In the knowledge of men, these things exist and matter. The body and all its elaborations defined, become, and mortal as they are, are an expression of the soul. But henceforth, knowledge of men implies also knowledge of those superlative human organisms that I call cultures, and of their mien, their speech, their acts, these terms being meant as we mean them already in the case of the individual. Descriptive, creative, physiognomic is the art of portraiture transferred to the spiritual domain. Don Quixote, Werther, Julian Sorel are portraits of an epoch. Faust, the portrait of a whole culture. Uh, for, the, for the nature researcher, the morphologist as systematist, the portrayal of the world is only a business of imitation and corresponds to the fidelity to nature and the likeness of the craftsman painter, who at bottom works on purely mathematical lines. But a real portrait in the Rembrandt, in the Rembrandt sense of the word is physiognomic, that is, history captured in a moment. The set of his self-portraits is nothing else but a truly Gertian autobiography. So should the biographies of the great cultures be handled. The fidelity part, the work of the professional historian on facts and figures, is only a means, not an end. The countenance of history is made up of all those things which hitherto we have only managed to evaluate according to personal standards, i.e., as beneficial or harmful, good or bad, satisfactory or unsatisfactory, political forms and economic forms, battles and arts, science and gods, mathematics and morals, everything whatsoever that has become is a symbol and the expression of a soul. Only to one having the knowledge of men will it unveil itself the restraint of a law it abhors. What it demands is that its significance should be sensed, and thus research reaches up to a final or superlative truth. Alles vergänglichle ist nur ein Gleichnis. Uh, that's the last line of Faust. Everything transitory is but a reference, meaning a reference to something immortal, something spiritual that isn't transitory. Uh, the nature researcher can be educated, but the man who knows history is born. Um, he seizes and pierces men and facts with one blow, guided by a feeling which cannot be acquired by learning or affected by persuasion, but which only too rarely manifests itself in full intensity. Direction, fixing, ordering, defining by cause and effect are things that one can do if one likes. These things are work, but the other is creation. Form and law Portrayal and comprehension, symbol and formula have different organs, and their opposition is that in which life stands to death, production to destruction. Reason, system, and comprehension kill as they cognize. That which is cognized becomes a rigid object, capable of measurement and subdivision. Intuitive vision, on the other hand, vivifies and incorporates the details in a living, inwardly felt unity. Poetry and historical study are kin Calculation and cognition also are kin, but, as Hebel says somewhere, systems are not dreamed and artworks are not calculated, or what is the same thing, thought out. The artist or the real historian sees the becoming of a thing, and he can reenact its becoming from its lineaments, whereas the systematist, whether he be physicist, logician, evolutionist, or pragmatical historian, 
learns the thing that has become. The artist's soul, like the soul of the culture, is something potential that may actualize itself, something complete and perfect, in the language of an older philosophy, a microcosm. The systematic spirit, narrow and withdrawn, abstract from the sensual, is an autumnal and passing phenomenon belonging to the ripest conditions of the culture, linked with the city, into which its life is more and more herded, it comes and goes with the city. In the classical world, there is science only from the 6th century Ionians to the Roman period, but there was art in the classical world for just as long as there was existence. Once more, a paradigm may help in elucidation, and he draws a little diagram here uh, where he has existence above consciousness above world image, and going horizontally with existence, he has soul person, uh, potentiality, Fulfillment, life becoming, direction, organic symbol, portrait, uh, with existence. He also has world actuality, the become, extension, mechanical, number, notion for consciousness. It, it's this, this process of uh, a world that comes... He's trying to convey, as, as best he can, uh, in an unpoetic language, although his prose is about as poetic as prose gets, I think, for, for a philosopher, this idea that civilizations are dreams. They come into being as dreams that express themselves through uh, a religious world image, an Aragnus event, as Heidegger would put it, that is expressed in the works of a Homer, or in the Eddas, in the Scandinavian period, or in the Gospels. These worlds spring forth dreamlike into being. They are beheld by the middle eye, the eye of vision that sees them and dreams them forth in poetic works, epics, sagas, poems, and gradually these forms over time, as the civilization becomes less rural and more urban, all you have to do is think of the Gospels and the people in there, the protagonists of the Gospels, they're just rural fishermen. They're poor, um, they're not particularly bright, they're just fishermen, rural rubes, basically. Paul is the intellect. When Paul converts from Judaism to Christianity, he brings in a cosmopolitan intellect into the Gospels that gets everything up and running. He gives it a kick, as it were. The, the visionary mode of Christ is given a kick with Paul's intellect uh, and with his letters, which begins to organize it and cognize it, uh, like Plotinus is the, also one of the first to do in that culture, to cognize a world, to order it, not to systematize it. Uh, Plotinus is not a systematist. Uh, Plotinus is, is a poet disguised as a philosopher. He's mummifying the world, wrapping it up. And so what Spengler is trying to convey here is that over time, this dreamlike vision slowly stiffens and petrifies as it becomes more and more urban. So you think of the time of the fishermen of the Gospels, then think of the time of Augustine living in Rome as a cosmopolite, an urban man. These are urban days here. Um, and uh, with the rise of the city and its victory over the town and the village and the hamlet, then first you get the creative artistic world city of Weimar or Florence or Vienna, uh, and gradually uh, the, in the intellect comes in and stiffens the picture uh, as the inspiration that set forth the spark that lit the civilization slowly dims and dies. It's like a fire that's burning on fuel that is not inexhaustible, but will burn that fuel out eventually, and it slowly dies as the intellect comes in and does its best to articulate the world image now in a very stiffened form language of laws and numbers and mathematics uh, as the world picture dies and slowly gives rise to the pure atheistic rationalism of the world city intellect of the cosmopolite, the megalopolitan man. Um, so the, that's basically his diagram there. And then he says, um, Seeking thus to obtain a clear idea of the unifying principle out of which each of these two worlds is conceived, we find that mathematically controlled cognition relates always, and the purer it is, the more directly, to a continuous present. The picture of nature dealt with by the physicist is that which is deployed before his senses at the given moment. It is one of the tacit but nonetheless firm presuppositions of nature research that nature the natur, notice that it's feminine there, the natur, um, is the same for every consciousness and for all times. An experiment is decisive for good and all, uh, time being not precisely denied, but eliminated from the field of investigation. 
Real history rests on an equally certain sense of the contrary. What it presupposes as its origin is a nearly indescribable sensitive faculty within, which is continuously labile under continuous impressions, and is incapable, therefore, of possessing what may be called a center of time. We shall consider later what the physicist means by time. The picture of history, be it the history of mankind, of the world of organisms, of the earth, or of the stellar systems, is a memory picture. Interesting. Memory. Namasani, who is the mother of all the muses, all nine of the muses, who are all patrons of the various uh, arts, lyrical poetry, uh, epic poetry, astronomy, uh, and so forth. Memory, in this connection, is conceived as a higher state, certainly not proper to every consciousness, and vouchsafed to many in only a low degree, a perfectly definite kind of imagining power, which enables experience to traverse each particular moment subspecie eternitatis, as one point in an integral made up of all the past and all the future, and it forms the necessary basis of all looking backward, all self-knowledge and all self-confession. In this sense, classical man has no memory and therefore no history, either in or around himself. No man can judge history, but one who has himself experienced history, says Goethe. In the classical world consciousness, all past was absorbed in the instant present. Compare the entirely historical heads of the Nuremberg Cathedral sculptures of Dürer, of Rembrandt, with those of Hellenistic sculpture, for instance, the famous Sophocles statue. The former tell the whole history of a soul, whereas the latter rigidly confines itself to expressing the traits of a momentary being, and tells nothing of how this being is the issue of a course of life, if indeed we can speak of course of life at all in connection with a purely classical man who is always complete and never becoming. Um, okay, so uh, I think we'll stop here for this video. Uh, we're making progress on the chapter on physiognomic and systematic. Actually, we're about halfway through it. It's, it's a rather short chapter, and then we'll move on after this to another chapter on the problem of world history, um, the idea of destiny and the principle of causality. This, this chapter is one of my favorites. This, this one's the bomb. Okay, so we'll stop here and try to finish the rest of this in one go. I think we can. Maybe. We'll try it.